Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Encouraging you to live as an ambassador of God's kingdom in the world. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. long to be? Who do you long to be or what do you long to be? When you think about all that you might be and who you might be, who do you long to be or what do you long to be? What do you long to have? Where do you long to go? Who do you long to be with? What do you long to be? I'm Carmen LaBerge and I'm grateful for you today. Um, And while I've got you here, let me ask where in the word are you today? We ask that question every single day here on Mornings with Carmen. Where in the Word are you today? I'm in 1 Timothy, and this passage from 1 Timothy is what got me thinking about where I long to be or what I long for. So 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 and 10. People who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money, longing for money, have uh, wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So what do you long for? This passage of Scripture also got me um, thinking about a woman that I met once whose name is Root. And this this actually, this conversation about Root um, connects to another conversation, the one out of uh, of North Georgia, where there was this school shooting just a couple of days ago. And um, there, there's conversation about, you know, is this a rooted community? Is this a family that was rooted? And so let's talk today a little bit about roots. And I'm going to use this woman that I, na- uh, that I met once, whose name is Root, as a as an exemplar here. So it's an unusual name. I thought it was an unusual name when I met her. And so I asked her about her name. I mean, you know, she introduced herself and her name is Root. And I'm just, I thought that was unusual. So um, she kind of chuckled and she said, well, it's not the first name my parents gave me. She said, my given name was Alice. But my grandmother started calling me Root when I was really little and it stuck. You see, my parents considered me the root of all their trouble. They considered me the root of anything bad that happened. (laughs) And I stood there for a moment and I thought to myself, that is so sad. So I said, I'm so sorry you were raised to believe that. And she immediately responded with joy on her face. Oh, no, I don't believe that. I know better. I am not the root of their problems, but there is a root. People ask me why I didn't change my name. And I said, well, it's a good reminder to me and everyone else that evil has a root. Hate has a root. Everything has a root, including love. Love has a root, she declared with like bold confidence. And, and that's when she, she said, I am a person whose story God has redeemed. I am rooted and grounded in love. And the love I have for myself and others is rooted in a love that God demonstrated for me in a person named Jesus. He is the root. He is my namesake. And I thought to myself, wow, that is is a demonstration of how you make Jesus the hero of your story. I mean, what others meant for evil, I mean, a grandmother who started calling her root because she considered her the root of all the problems in their family, are you kidding me? But God redeemed it. God took what others meant for evil, and he has used it for good in the life of a woman named Root. And I am pretty sure that my eyes were wide as saucers at this point in our conversation because she laughed at the expression on my face, and she said, yes, it is amazing. That's what I remember her saying, yes, like in agreement with the astonishment on my face. And and she said, if you think anything is amazing, 
please let all the glory go to God. And I thought, that is so good. What a way to allow your name to be a source of conversation and a conversation that points to God. I am sure that the woman named Root could have told me all kinds of horrendous stories about her past, about her family of origin, about the traumas she she experienced. But that's not the story she chose to tell. She chose to, to tell the story of redemption, that she is rooted and grounded in love, that she is redeemed. And And this is the point in time when she did the most extraordinary thing. She reached down to the ground where we were standing. And you know when somebody does something and you say to yourself, they've done that before. Like, this is, this is a bit of what they do. She reached down to the ground and she just pulled up a plant by the root. And she said, look at this. Look at this. And when she said it, she said it with the kind of authority that I imagine Jesus possessed. Look at this. And so I began to examine the plant in her hand and its root. She said, what part of the plant does the world see? And I said, well, the green part. And she said, exactly. And she turned it over so that all that I could see was the roots. And she said, at first, we don't consider what lies beneath. We don't immediately see what's under the surface of another person's life. But this is where the real life is happening. This is where life is sustained and drawn. So I met Root a long time ago now. She was a county extension agent in South Texas, um, and I lived there in the, in the late 1990s. And she spent her life growing in faith and growing other people's capacity to grow food in sustainable ways on their own land. And she helped people weather drought and storms. And she walked with people in plenty and in want and joy and in sorrow. And she bore a name that was meant as a condemnation, <laughs> but she bore it as a gospel witness. She was rooted and grounded in love. Her life was a bountiful harvest of righteousness. I remember that um, on the back of her Ford pickup truck, she had a bumper sticker, kind of a very rudimentary bumper sticker, like a white sticker with black lettering. And it didn't it didn't write out the whole verse. It just referenced this verse, 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10. And beneath the Bible verse, just two words, roots matter. So let's listen again to today's Growing Your Faith verse of the day with root in mind and with the fact that roots matter. People who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. What are you rooted in? What's going on beneath the surface? Because it's the root that produces the fruit. Our friend Than Bennett is going to join us. He is the host of The Equipped and the author of The Equipped Newsletter. And we're going to talk with him next about wealth. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. MR Pigs. MR Pigs. It is a joke in my family, and it came to mind when I read Than Bennett's The Equipped newsletter this week. Than, good morning. MR Pigs. Carmen, good morning. And, you know, before we even get to the true, I was thinking before we came on air, you know, this is probably a conversation that you have a lot about pigs. Mm-hmm. This is a conversation mm-hmm. very common around my house. How, how many of your listeners, Carmen, have ever had a conversation with their neighbor about their pigs? Do, do you have an uh, idea? All, all of them in Iowa. All oh, of okay. my, yeah. everyone yeah. listening in Iowa has had a conversation about pigs. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like there are some communities where, like, Pigs and chickens, this is this this is regular conversational fodder. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. we're we're a week and a half away from our pigs, you know, becoming bacon, <sighs> which is just like it's like it should be a national holiday, Carmen. It's just so unbelievable. But bacon day. at the bacon same time. Day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I started writing this and I'm like, I, I was talking to my neighbor about pigs. This is not gonna relate to almost anyone. It's kind it's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in in other farm related news, since it is Friday and I tend to give a farm report on Friday, um, we had thought that we had done a good job scheduling our four cows, you know, to to go off and visit the man from whom they come back in packages. 
And um, we just, he just notified us that we're not on the schedule until after the first of the year because oh, yeah. hunting season, his hunting season processing is like, you know, going to be underway. And I'm like, well, wait a second. That's not, that wasn't our plan. So there you go. Not all the plans work out exactly as, you know, <clears throat> my calendar. Yeah, that's out. actually, that's actually a big deal. Uh, really problematic, Carmen. Are you going to it's a, it's a big process deal. in there yourselves or no, what are you going to do? No, no <laughs> okay. I don't know. I'm open to ideas. Okay. The man from and, whom they and, come back in packages. That's that's exactly. great. I'm writing Well, that I down. don't have yeah. a nicer way to say that, but yeah, he's yeah. Amish and he's the man from whom they come back in packages. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, they leave on hoof and they come back without them. Yep. Um, so, MR Pigs, talk with us about your pigs. You and Tom were discussing pigs. Who is Tom and why were you talking about pigs? Yeah, so Tom is my neighbor. He's a good friend. And he and another neighbor and I, we went in this year to each get two feeder pigs. This is the it's the third year, Carmen, that we our family has raised raised pigs. But we went in with these two neighbors this year to each get a female pig and a male pig. And they're closing in on 300 pounds now, so it's time to process them. And so I saw Tom at a neighborhood gathering. And of course, we were talking about pigs, right? Um, but But Tom... <sighs> gave like what is devastating news for those in the the feeder pig, you know, business or operation. We only raise pigs to feed our family, but he said, "Fan, I'm I'm down to one pig." He'd started with two, he's down to one. One had uh, suddenly passed away. He wasn't sure why. And Carmen, like that's, that's almost as significant news as your butcher not being able to mm-hmm. take your cows for processing because you're, you're, you're planning on that, that sustenance for your family for mm-hmm. a certain amount mm-hmm. of time. Right. And so you've Absolutely. lost 50% of your production. And so I was, I was really devastated for Tom, actually, you know, I know the amount of care, even the love that goes into raising animals. I knew about the financial investment. And so I was, I was really sad for him, but he, he responded to me this way, Carmen, and this is really kind of the crux of what I share in, in the true this week in the newsletter. He said, uh, fan, I, I'm wealthy and so are you. And Carmen, as I listened to you share about, uh, the root, uh, th- this was so apropos, we desire to be rich. We desire to be wealthy. And Carmen, those of us that have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are indescribably wealthy in so many ways. Um, it really, really beyond any material measure that we could give. And, and Tom did mean that. And I want to come back to, to that in just a moment. But he meant more than that, too. He, he actually meant it in a material sense as well. He said, I still have one pig. And even if I didn't, I have the luxury of having the resources to try this, to try to work to raise my own food. And that makes me wealthy. And so Carmen, b- before I return to sort of the eternal wealth sense, I just I just think that's such good perspective for those of us who do have the resources and the the luxury to try things like this. I can try to raise pigs for my family and if it fails, my kids are still going to eat, right? Such mm-hmm. good perspective. Uh, but to return to sort of the eternal perspective uh, that, that Tom had, I, I love how 2 Corinthians 6 describes it. He says that servants of God who have nothing still possess everything. And so I think this is this is the message that you were bringing in the opening dialogue here. How, how do we define wealth? If we define it instinctively as I did in my conversation with Tom that you lost a pig and oh no, what you know what's going to happen, then it's going to be elusive. The loss of sustenance, the loss of a job, the loss of resources is going to shake that foundation. There will there will quite frankly never be enough. It's an insatiable fire, Carmen. It just is. But If we define it as Paul did in his letter to the Corinth church, if we define it as Tom did in his conversation with me about pigs, then we will be wealthy because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, no matter what happens in our our financial sense. And so I would just leave your listeners with that question. Are you wealthy? And if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the answer is a resounding yes. And I would just pose this, Carmen. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is the only way to be truly wealthy. And so I really encourage you from the bottom of my heart uh, to begin a relationship with him today. We're talking with Than Bennett. He is the host of The Equipped here on the Faith Radio Network. You can also find what we're talking about at theequippednewsletter.com. Um, And when we come back from a very, very brief break, we're going to move from this conversation about wealth and the reality of our true wealth to some of the things that are going on in the world, including 
um, an eternal perspective on the hostages um, who were killed this past week by Hamas in tunnels um, under Gaza. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. 150 million people, 150 million people actively use one particular app every month in the United States of America. I want that to be the Faith Radio app. How about you? If you're wondering how you could be encouraged in your faith at any time, anywhere, well, I got good news for you. There's literally an app for that. You can listen to Faith Radio live, any show on demand, no matter where you are at any time of the day or night. Download the free Faith Radio app right now. It's super easy. Just text the word app to 877-933-2484 and click the link. Let's connect faith to life. Just think for a moment about your your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors, your friends, the people you live with in community. And then let's recognize that on October the 7th, 2023, um, Hamas insurgents, terrorists entered into those communities and robbed families not only of their peace, but their homes, their financial possessions, um, the lives of uh, of their neighbors, and hauled uh, hundreds of them across the border into Gaza, where they have been held underground as hostages um, for 11 months. Uh, the stories of six of those hostages ended when they were executed by their uh, Hamas captors as Israeli defense forces um, sought to reach them. And so we're talking with Than Bennett. He's the host of the Equipped and we're reading from the Equipped Newsletter, which you can find at theequippednewsletter.com. I'm happy to send you that direct link. You can just text me, 877-933-2484. Fan, um, it's hard to have an eternal perspective on mm-hmm. contemporary events that are so multilayered and horrific, but I appreciate your willingness to do so. Carmen, uh, this is a story that made me weak in the knees when I read it. I've got to be very honest with you. It, you know, this story has been playing out since October 7th, really long before that as well. But this current iteration of it's been playing out since October 7th, as you mentioned, when I, I, I don't think there's any way to say it other than evil personified in human action uh, triggered the events that we're seeing today. Uh, you just, you described it well, six hostages were, were slain where they were slain right before they were rescued in a tunnel beneath Rafa. There are six families as well as their, uh, you know, friends and relatives who are now grieving their, uh, loss forever on earth. You know, for, for those who had a relationship with Jesus Christ, there's a reunification coming in heaven. But the, the story of this week is one of great grief. It happens at the same time that there was a, a limited ceasefire that was agreed to in order to vaccinate a bunch of children against uh, polio in Gaza. So just the human suffering in this region as a result of the evil that was perpetrated on October 7th continues to play out. And you know, Carmen, I, I, I share in the newsletter a couple of eternal perspectives, and I actually only want to briefly mention those because I want to I want to tie this back into what you said at the beginning of the broadcast. People can go to the equipnewsletter.com and read a little bit more about my eternal perspective, which is rooted in the fact that every person is made in the image of God and has eternal value. We find that in Genesis 1, and I think there's a real value there to hold as we try to work in this tension of, of a peace that seems elusive. But let's return to your thought about about the root, because this is an example of good and evil being on vivid display in the world. When, when I encourage people to hold tension, uh, to hold this kind of tension as they consider world events, I, it's not a call to neutrality, Carmen. Uh, we are to be uh, supporters of truth. We are to be defenders of truth. We are to be aggressive defenders of those who are oppressed and, and standing against evil. And I think this is a story where that has to happen. But here's here's my encouragement and as we as Jesus followers work to do that. We have to make sure that we propose solutions that are in a route that will hold. And what I see among many of us, and I'm looking in the mirror here, I see us uh, depending on solutions that are in a route that will not last. We put them in wealth or resources or politics or things that will pass away. 
Carmen, we need to be offering a solution that is rooted in Jesus Christ and one that will last forever. And we set ourselves up for disappointment and we set others up for being led astray if we root that solution in anything else. And so in this story about these these families that are now suffering, offering the gospel of Jesus Christ as the solution for those who are grieving, Carmen, that's the only way. It really, in reality, that this grieving will pass. That is the only way that they and all of us can take hold of a joy that will last forever. When I think about these um, these individuals um, whose lives we have in view in this particular conversation. Um, I just I, there's so much loss, um, mm-hmm. and and my heart goes out to, you know, their, their friends and their family members. And then my heart goes up to God, you know, like Mm -hmm. I, I I cannot make sense of that, which is so horrifically evil and complicated um, and dark. Um, You have a, you have a very, very hope oriented story um, as well. And that is out of the Paralympics in Paris. Can you, can you bring that into view for us? Yeah, Carmen, I, I have always loved the Olympic Games. I love the Olympic Games this year. This this is really the first time I have paid uh, a little bit of attention, a closer attention to the Paralympics, which were held, are, are, they're wrapping up now, but they're held right after the Olympic Games in Paris. I, I would describe it this way. It was 4,000 of the world's best athletes, and I would put a period there, actually, 4,000 of the world's best athletes. Now, each of these athletes are competing with a disability. And Carmen, I took in a a fair amount of the swimming and a fair amount of the basketball because those are two sports that are are close to our family. I'm a long, long time basketball player and my, my children are all swimmers. Unbelievable stuff, Carmen. I mean, when you talk about the wheelchair basketball, you you talk mm. about people who were throwing their bodies on the floor without ability to to brace themselves from the fall. In in, in the swimming, there were there were athletes without arms throwing themselves into the water. I can hardly imagine the fear that had to be overcome at one point to begin that training, right? And yet they're they're competing at a level that is above uh, what I can compete at. So unbelievable. But I, but I, just, I just thought it is such an example of A, being fearfully and wonderfully made. But, but Carmen, it's also a, a, an example of embracing what it is God has put in you, right? I think there's there's such a temptation for us to think, oh, what what did God not put in me? What is what is in someone else that I wish was in me? If we would instead embody what is on display at the Paralympics and think, what is the unique mix of God's uh, character and abilities and attributes that He has placed in me, and how can I maximize those? Carmen, I think that is the way that we embody Isaiah 43, 21, which is a call to praise God's name with everything that we have. And I just think that's on display at the, at the Paralympics. And so even though they're wrapping up, if, if anyone out there did not catch any of it, I encourage you, maybe, maybe check out some replays of some of the swimming. It is some of the most remarkable displays of courage and excellence, I would say, uh, that you will ever see. So you know me, I'm a um, I'm a fan of the beautiful at the uh, at the bottom of the equipped newsletter, and I, I we could talk about today's, but I really want to go back a couple of weeks and talk about that bunt cake that was on that pedestal plate with the lemon sitting next to it, because <laughs> I still like I would like to have a piece of that. Um, you cannot because I ate. Pretty That's much gone, all isn't of it. it. Yeah, it tell is. Me, and, is it lemon? Because there's lemons in the picture as well. Like I can tell you that you can tell Brooke. Carmen looked at that picture and she could taste the cake. Like I could taste the cake. <laughs> uh, it, it was lemon. I, I don't mm-hmm. even. You know, look. Mm. I I cannot give you all of the specifics. I just know it was delicious mm. because the the, mm-hmm. the the inside the cake was lemon. I don't know what the icing was, but it was just it was just unbelievable. And um, if I recall correctly, Carmen, uh, the when when I have comfort food like that, and yes, I consider bun mm. cake comfort food. Totally, one hundred percent. Yes, I go to a peaceful place. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think uh, recognizing those gifts that God has give us, given us, the goodness of the earth, the goodness that he has produced and, and enjoying them in what can seem to be simple ways, Carmen, it's a way to connect with his goodness. And so um, I, I would love to share the next lemon bunt cake with you, but you got to be there like day of because no, t- otherwise 100%. it's gone. No, I, it's gone. I get that. I, I understand that. And I would like to suggest that the next time that you feature 
a photo like this <clears throat> and you are referring to, you know, peace of mind, peace of Christ, and in view is a piece of cake, you have to make the literal. I mean, you, you like you have to make that literary connection. You have to be like the peace of Christ in a piece of cake. Like, uh, you, you just you just have you just just go ahead and go there. I, I feel like a guest <sighs> columnist, uh, Carmen LeBurge, in The Beautiful, uh, accompanied with an image from my wife. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah. No, 100%. Mine is all going to be about a piece of cake and a piece and the peace of Christ. Yes. Or mine might be pie. Well, what I'm a about big a pie what, fan. What about a piece of bacon? Can we do bacon and cake at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, now, now, now my, um, my culinary uh, interests are being piqued. So yes, possibly there might be there. I mean, you know, I'm a savory pie girl too. So I, I could totally work a piece of, uh, work some bacon into, into a quiche or yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I, there's really not, there's really not a baked item of any kind that I'm not a fan of. So yes, bake, bacon can be worked in for sure. I think we should probably land on bacon wrapped cheesecake. Glory to God. There we go. There's somebody. There there's somebody out there slathering bacon and maple syrup and putting it in the oven right now, and they are inviting us over. I'm coming. I'm on yeah, my way. The, uh, the text. The text line is open eight seven seven nine three three two four eight four. Carmen and Fan looking for invitations. Hey, thank you, brother. We really appreciate it. Love you, Carmen. Yeah, that is mutual. All right, that's Than Bennett. You absolutely need to be checking out what he's writing at the equippednewsletter.com. The audio version of the newsletter is what we call the equipped here on the Faith Radio Network, so you can check that out as well. If you'd like the direct link to today's newsletter, happy to send it to you. Just text me, 877-933-2484. Appreciate Mary um, from Spokane on the text line. In answer to the question of where in the word are you today, Mary said, I'm in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. What are you holding on to today? Who are you holding on to today? What are you holding up to God in prayer today? I am uh, uh, holding on to him with you, um, to a hope that does not disappoint. His name is Jesus. Mary, thank you for that text um, on the text line. It's open for you as well, 877-933-2484. Our friend Dan DeWitt is going to join us next from Theolatte.com. We're going to talk about heresies. Yes, heresies, ancient heresies, now being turned into musicals. Yes, would you go to a heretical musical? That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. All right, I have a creative challenge for our friend Dan DeWitt. I would like for him to turn the trial of Martin Luther into a musical. Good morning, Dan. <laughs> Good morning, Carmen. Mm-hmm. What's crack a Mm-hmm. It is, um, it, it, there is the hint of fall in the air. I've actually, I've like driven east and west enough to know that there are some trees that are beginning to bear witness to the fact that it's not yes. going to be summer a whole lot longer. That's my, that's yeah. my testimony this morning. And you can hear the I crickets. Can't... The crickets are like the giveaway. Oh. They like sing to us that the autumn, the hey. autumn is upon us. Do, and I will wait, know... we have to go back to the Luther thing. Oh, so no, I'm going my to friend thing, who's, don't a, worry. who's a Christian rapper um, is, is Lutheran. And I think we need to talk to flame about helping to write the script for a Hamilton style Luther production musical. Okay, Hamilton style. Yeah. Luther production. Like it's going to be in rap. It's going to be in rap. Okay, so Lori Fry. Amazing. Write down the name Lori Fry and let's just get them together and make it happen. That's yep. her kind of thing. Making that kind of thing Done. happen is her kind of thing. Okay. So that sounds awesome. I think that a a turning something, you know, Luther into a musical would be really fun. Um, what is a heresy? Can I start there because I'm going to ask you about a heresy that's been turned into a musical? And so I feel like yeah. I need a definition first. So first we have to define what a heresy is not. And so the word orthodox um, means really rightly ordered beliefs. And so you can think about an orthodontist. An orthodontist straightens your teeth, 
helps what? them feel rightly That's aligned. That's why an orthodontist is an orthodontist? Yeah. That's yeah. Word of the day. And so to be orthodox is to have rightly ordered um, Christian beliefs. And something that is outside of that is considered a heresy. It's a departure from the fundamental core beliefs of Christianity. I'm, I am now forever using orthodontist as my explanation for orthodoxy because we all know that an orthodontist helps us straighten our teeth, rightly ordered teeth. Yes. And so yeah. orthodoxy, rightly ordered, you know, thoughts, rightly ordered, and then like ortho, orthopraxis, like rightly mm-hmm. ordered behavior, rightly ordered practices. I love that. That is so good. Okay, so heresies, wrongly ordered. I mean, right? I mean, heretical, that which is askew, that which is afoul of the truth. So um, who was Pelagius and why was Pelagius a heretic? So Pelagius was a heretic. Um, He was a British theologian and he lived in the 300s, 400s, um, so 4th, 5th century. And he taught that man is basically good and he denied the doctrine of original sin. And so up today, sometimes a theologian will be, uh, there will be like an allegation that someone's Pelagian in their theology. If it sounds like they're denying um, that we are the, the, sin, the doctrine of total depravity, that every part of us is affected by sin, um, which I should clarify just in case someone's listening, the, the view of original sin, the Adam sinned, um, and that sin nature has been passed on to all of his descendants. Um, and that we are born with a bent towards sin does not mean we're as bad as we can be or that we don't have worth or that we're not capable of doing wonderful, beautiful things, um, but rather that everything we do is going to in some way be affected and tainted by sin. And so Pelagian denied that. Okay, now I want to talk about a couple of people who are evangelical Christians. That's how they identify. They met mm-hmm. um, uh you know, years back um, at an evangelical Christian university, they started working on music together. Their music, these Christian artists, their music is what is featured in this musical that is really celebrating the ancient heresy of Pelagius. So talk with me about sort of, you know, that complicated narrative. I wrote this music to honor God. It's now being used literally to dishonor God. Yeah. And it's an interesting, of course, we have a, a, there's a link in the, in the worldview reader, and I'm sure it'll be in your show notes as well to the RNS piece, ancient heresies. And the title of the piece is ancient heresies set to Gunger's music and new Pelagius musical. And so um, the Gungers, this couple, um, their, their story is, is, is a not uncommon story where they've um, really reckoned with what they believe. Um, mm-hmm. And it sounds like they're still in process. Of course, we all are. We're all on a journey. Um, but there's been a movement from what could be considered more of an Augustan um, view of theology. So for most people that would be pretty, you know, somewhat well-read in theology, they'd be familiar with these names of Augustine and Pelagius. Um, Augustine taught um the very strongly the doctrine of original sin and total depravity. And so in contrast, we have Augustine and Pelagius. And this couple on that spectrum started out one way and drifted towards more of a, a Pelagian view. And this musical is really illustrating Pelagius, but then they felt like there was something missing in it. So they brought in Augustine. And so I was reminded of a a painting I have that illustrates this. I have a painting at I have a replica, I should be clear, a replica of a painting from the 16th century, um, and it's a painting of Augustine, this church father, um, theologian, who influenced, um, in many ways, the thinking of John Calvin years after him. And so some people will joke and say Augustine was a Calvinist um, long before John Calvin was born. He was the original Calvinist. But this replica of a painting of Augustine, he's holding his heart and it's not a bloody heart, but a, you know, kind of a Valentine looking heart and it's on fire. It's in flames and it's being drawn towards the light that's coming in from the window. There's the Latin word in it, 
veritas, which is the Latin word for truth. And then if you look at the painting, Pelagius's or Augustine's foot is standing on a book that on the side of it says Pelagius. So this contrast between orthodoxy and heresy is really lived out in this play, and it's embodied in the story of this artist, this couple that you mentioned. So I think that this um, this stage drama, um, this musical, is is one of those things that I can point to and say, because there's not a lot of information about a person's backstory, sometimes creatives will make up a backstory, and then mm-hmm. people in the public square receive that as true. And so I just want people to be aware of that as you might be considering this Pelagius musical Um you know, just recognize that we don't know a lot about Pelagius's background or his backstory. And so the story that is told about him um, in the musical is made up by the creators of the musical. So there's a lot of creative license mm-hmm. in terms of what's happening on the stage. Um, if you, you know, if you happen to take in this particular uh, story and storyline, I do think the juxtaposition of, of, of Augustine with Pelagius is interesting as well. I mean, obviously I think that Augustine won that battle in terms mm-hmm. of um, the 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 conversation about orthodoxy. But I would definitely say Pelagius has more ongoing influence in the world today in terms of the way emerging generations are thinking. Like if you ask people on the street, are people basically good? More people say people are basically good than say people are basically bad. Yeah, I think that, that that's right. I think that's right. In terms of the life of the church, Augustine is a hero and certainly yes. one in that sense. But in terms of broader culture, I do think that the kind of the basic instinct is to say that we're good. And yet the way we talk about human culture, the way we talk about others, the headlines kind of tell a different story. And so I think what we have to be careful to, to do is to make sure that as we talk about the doctrine of original sin, what the Bible describes as Adam's sin being passed on to us, that we don't paint a picture that humans are incapable of doing anything beautiful, incapable of doing anything good, apart from the saving grace of God. But rather, we'd say we're made in God's image. We are recipients of what's called common grace, that God's not breathing out his judgment on us the way he should. And because of these things, we are capable of both beauty and and evil— and how do we make sense of that? Um, does Pelagius' theology make good sense of it? Or does Augustine's view that brings us back to the biblical text, does it seem to account for the human experience? And this play seems to be an illustration of that journey of trying to find answers to the big questions in life. Yeah, it's really good. So if you're if you're thinking, hey, I didn't really know something that I could bring up maybe with somebody in an emerging generation that would get us talking about music. It would get us talking about theology. It would get us talking about what's happening sort of on the stages of, uh, of, of the public, you know, consumerism art culture. This is it. So we'd love to send you the link to the story from religion news, um, as a, you know, as a talking point, you can find it in this week's worldview reader at theolatte.com. I can also send you directly to that on the text line 877-933-2484. When we come back, I am going to ask Dan DeWitt to help us process something. When somebody says, I'm processing, what does that mean? And as a Christian, how am I supposed to be processing? And where does that process lead? That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. When was the last time someone asked you to pray for them? When's the last time you asked someone to pray for you? Here at Faith Radio, we pray with and for you about the concerns in your life, and we share with you the concerns of others. We are a praying people. So we want to invite you to share your prayer request with us. Our team prays continually and intentionally once a week for the request that we receive. And so share your prayer requests with Faith Radio by texting or calling 877-933-2484. You can share your prayer requests with us, and you can be confident that we are praying for you. Lindsay's on the text line this morning. There's a lot of processing going on in her, um, in her community in Texas, uh, about a month ago, there was a, a, a tragic loss of her 
um, beloved pastor. And mm. she's sharing this morning, Lindsay's sharing, you know, you know, this processing and um, the sweet wife of the pastor, you know, withdrawing. And some people grieve um, by withdrawing from community, but that's really hard for the community of faith when, you know, they really at some level want and need to be grieving together. And so as people process things differently, I was thinking, Dan, um, that you and I could just talk about what what does it mean to process something? When somebody tells me they're processing, I feel like they are saying, I need some space, leave me alone. Mm -hmm. Please discontinue giving me your input. Um, So when you hear somebody say that they're processing, what does that mean? And then as Christians, like what should be a part of that? How should I be processing as a Christian? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I'm I'm reminded of the the book Boundaries, which is a a best-selling book. And that, that's a really helpful, helpful book. And I think when I hear someone say they're processing, it kind of depends on the relationship and the tone. Um, but I think it's them just trying to share. I've I I need a I need to state a boundary, like you said. I need some room to think about something. I think that everyone processes differently, and so some people isolate and they need time alone. Some people insulate, um, where they want to be around more and more people. Um, and so I think our processing can look different. I'm either going to surround myself with activity and I just want to unplug from this troublesome thing. Right. Um, and so for me, I isolate, um, instead of, you know, wanting to surround myself with activity and people, but in either, in either case, we need to respect people's boundaries, but then also let them know that we're here. And so I want to give you space. I want to respect that, but also to, be um, mindful enough to to ask the question, as I give you space, please let me know if there's anything I could do that would be helpful. And then to check in from time to time. And the fact that they want to process means they don't want you to do that too much. And so, but there is a Psalm that comes to mind when I think about processing in terms of beliefs, you know, I, we have to process all of life. Um, and all of the human experience, you know, we have to kind of work through and reflect on our experiences and what we think about and what we believe is important and how we should act in the world. You mentioned the word orthopraxy earlier, how we can align our actions with our beliefs um, to make adult decisions about our convictions and what we believe is true. But when I think about processing beliefs, I, I, I always go back to Psalm 73, which is a Psalm of Asaph, who wrote several Psalms. Um, so he's a, a biblical writer. He was also a musician. The Old Testament, I believe it's in Second Chronicles, refers to him as a seer. He was a prophet. Um, and then we also know from the Old Testament that he had, there was a group of people who called themselves the sons of Asaph. They were his kind of groupies. And so this guy was a rock star, um, wrote scripture, prophecy, um, had students, just a musician, kind of like an Old Testament Chris Tomlin. <laughs> not, not that Chris Tomlin's a prophet. Like this guy was a celebrity and a spiritual leader. But in Psalm 73, he's like, I had to process some stuff. And he mentions in that Psalm that he almost walked away from his faith. Um, and he asked the question, um, is, is serving God um, in vain? Have I served God in vain? Which I think is really could be reframed as, is serving God worth it? <laughs> And for Asaph, it was seeing people live however they wanted, and they seemed to have a much easier and more fulfilling life. So Asaph says, look, this is what happened. Um, And then he gets to the end of the psalm, and he says, but if I had shared this, in verse 15, he says, if I had said what he just describes in the psalm, if I had said I will speak thus and just aired out what he was processing, he says, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. And I think that that's a helpful, for me, reminder of when I'm processing and thinking through something, maybe I'm hurt, uh, maybe I'm confused, that there is an appropriate time where we don't air all of that. And for Asaph, he worked through it, and then he gets to the end of the psalm, and he says that when he came into God's sanctuary, in verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. And so we need to give people space to process, but on a personal level, I would say, if you're really processing some deep stuff, what you believe, there you may not want to rush to social media with it. Work through it, and there's an appropriate time to to think it through and to start verbally processing with with others. 
Hope some of that encourage- made sense, Carmen. Oh, no, absolutely. I want to encourage you as you're listening right now, like to just think about how you process. Do you process by pulling away and isolating, moving away from people and away from activities? Um, Asaph processed in private because he knew that if he processed in public, it would um, be detrimental to others in terms of their walk of faith. So, mm-hmm. so um, some, some people move toward other people and activities um, when they're processing, and some of us isolate, we pull away. And so um, I just want to maybe speak directly there to, um, to our friend Lindsay and say, you know, it's possible that your pastor's widow is, is pulling away from community, not, not in any way um, to, to wound or harm those of you in the community, but because that's the particular way she needs to process in the midst of this deep, deep grief. Um, and so how can we, as Dan uh, encourages us, you know, how can we continue to provide for the needs of um, support people um, when they are isolating in their time of processing? Um, and maybe we don't even wait for them to tell us what we can do to help. Maybe we just do some of the obvious things. So if that yard needs mowing, mow it. If that trash mm-hmm. needs taking out, take out the trash. If, um, you know, if people need food, um, deliver it. Like, just do the things that no one is going to ask you to do, um, but that are so obvious that, that need doing. So I just want to encourage you in that today. Dan, we're, we're out of time, so we don't actually... Uh, we don't have time to talk about this wonderful um, uh, piece that you have posted at theolate.com on the subject of leadership um, and the final line. So I'm just going to send it out to folks um, on the text line. Um, thank you so very much for being with us today and walking with us through these conversations. Carmen, can I insert really quick? Asaph ends his psalm with, but for me, it is good to be near God. I've made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell all of your works. Mm, that's so good. You can always add something at the end. I love that. Thank you so much. <laughs> so good to be with you. Yeah, likewise. I want to encourage you to draw unto God today. However you're processing, be sure you're processing in the presence of the living God. He can handle it. Um, he knows your thoughts before you know them. He knows the words before they're on your lips. Um, he knows you at the cellular level, and he loves you. He loves you. There's no place that you could go that God doesn't see you. Um, the darkness is never so dark that God doesn't know what's happening there. And so turn to him. Wherever you are, whatever grief you're facing, whatever challenge confronts you today, God loves you. He's closer to you than your next breath. So if you have a sense that God is far from you, like maybe physically get up and turn around. Like look around. Look for evidence. Like change your physical posture and perspective because God has not abandoned you. You are not forsaken. Um, And so let us open our hearts and eyes today as we are processing the things that are happening in our own lives and in the lives of those we love and in the world that God so loves as we're seeking to process things. Let's be sure we are processing those things in communion with and conversation with God. Let's, let's, let's get before him as we process. We got another hour up next. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LeBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.